Okay, so welcome everybody to this afternoon's event, uh, Writing Lost Lives, Medieval Women and Stillbirth. Um, it's fantastic to see such a good turnout this afternoon, so thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we are very delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Lucy Allen Goss, who is this afternoon's presenter. Um, before I hand over to her, who you were waiting to see, I'll just say a little bit about the Oxford Centre for Life Writing and the Lives in Medicine project, which this event is part of. Um, so here at the Oxford Centre for Life Writing, which is we call OCLU for short, we're interested in the many faces of life writing, uh, from biography, autobiography, memoir, letters, to the less obvious forms of life writing, such as social media, blogs, graphic novels, music and opera. And as in, as in the case of the Lives in Medicine strand, uh, we're interested in all the notes and the transcripts and the diaries and letters and accounts that emerge around the edges of illness and health and birth and death and caring and being cared for. And at the heart of the Lives of Medicine project, we have this really exciting new database, which is still in development, about uh, 10,000 uh, patient um, accounts and growing. And we have um, an interdisciplinary and multi-institutional research network who are all working with the database um, and with one another to try to find out, ask how these different kinds of voices can be listened to. And indeed, why in some cases these voices are barely listened to at all. And the eventual aim of Lives in Medicine is, we hope, to arrive at insights that might measurably improve the quality and ethical environment of medicine by just bringing to more prominence these, um, these lives in medicine, the voices of, of, of the patient. Um, this project is held by OCLU and the Wolfson Digital Research Cluster and the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutes in the US. And our research network has actually been meeting behind the scenes for a very long time. And this is the first of our events which we've opened to the public. Um, and it's fantastic to see that there is such an appetite for, um, you know, to just to learn about how people lived and how people experience and speak about the way that their lives encounter um, met, ha their experiences of medicine. So before I hand over to Lucy, just a little bit of housekeeping. I think Lucy will probably speak for about half an hour-ish. Um, and then we'll have about half an hour-ish for questions. Um, please type your questions into the chat if that's all right. Um, what I'll do is I'll just read them out. Um, it might help me if you write a big capital letter Q before your question so I can spot them. Um, and um, we are recording the event, so please do keep your camera turned off if you don't want to um, appear in a recording, which will be archived on our website. And so with the housekeeping out of the way, let me hand over to Lucy. Thank you so much for being with us. Lucy is a member of the Lives of Medicine Network. She's also an Irish um, Research Council doctoral fellow in the History Department at Trinity College Dublin. And her book, Female Desire in Chaucer's Legend of Good Women and Middle English Romance came out last year. But today she's here to share her current research into the cultural constructions of pregnancy and pregnancy loss in medieval England. So I'll hand over to Lucy and we'll forgive in advance if there are any complications sharing your screen because it's never a, never a straightforward thing. Hi, thank you very much for that. I'm just gonna get on to sharing my screen and working out how I do that first and then I'll, right, great. Can everybody see that? That's good. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for having me and thanks to Tamarin for hosting. Um, as Tamarin says, my research is an Irish Council postdoc fellowship. Um, I'm funded by them and I'm very grateful. Um, my talk today is partly a reflection really on the difficulty of writing about medieval women's lives in medicine and especially about the difficulty of writing about historical pregnancy loss. As we've just heard, the Lives in Medicine project seeks to construct an archive of materials relating to lived experience, but a huge amount of lived experience never makes it into conventional documentary form. And that's kind of my interest and my area of research. Sometimes because things aren't recorded in the way we traditionally expect, they slip between the cracks or become invisible in the historical record. And this slipping between the cracks isn't even a purely historical problem. Today in the UK, pregnancy and pregnancy loss may seem highly documented, but still there are silences. The hospital I know best publishes monthly breakdown statistics for maternity care on its Facebook page. The graphic includes numbers of boys and girls, C-sections and vaginal deliveries, numbers of twins, even triplets. And of course, it also records the number of stillbirths. Stillbirth is alarmingly common. In the UK, on average, about eight babies 
uh, a day, a stillborn, and often we still don't know the medical reasons why. But despite this, stillbirth often seems to be an incredibly isolating and disorienting experience. It often comes as a huge shock. People don't expect it, they're not prepared for it, they believe it to be a much less common event than it is. And perhaps because of that, we really don't have a lot of rituals or socially sanctioned ways of recognising a stillborn baby and acknowledging that particular kind of loss. The anthropologist Linda Lane, who does amazing work in this area, has published a great deal about contemporary experiences of pregnancy loss. And she argues very powerfully that we really struggle as a society to find ways of recognising stillbirth as a kind of real tangible loss and a stillborn baby as a real baby. And this causes enormous harm and trauma to people who suffer this kind of loss. And when I went looking for first count, uh, sorry, first person accounts of loss, such as you would find in the lives of Medicine Archive, I found that people are using a particular kind of language. So this is on the slide. One woman says, stillbirth. To me, that was a term from medieval times. It was something that happened to Henry VIII's wife. It wasn't something that happened to me. It wasn't something that happened in this day and age with all the medical advancements we have. So it took me a long time to grasp. That was one account. And another account I came across said, before I was pregnant, I thought stillbirth was something from the Victorian age. And before that, I had no idea it still happened. I find this second quotation really hard to read because it comes, as you'll see, from a piece in The Independent. It's a campaigning piece. But the woman who wrote it was in my NCT group. And it really hits you that we're not prepared. None of us were prepared. None of us really took on board that this was a thing that still happened and still happened despite sounding like such a historical strange word, a stillbirth isn't even a word that feels like contemporary language. So I was really struck by this language. I was struck by the way that there's a sense stillbirth is outside of normal progressive 21st century medicine. And we can even see this association between stillbirth and the past in medical professionals accounts. So a few years ago, there was an investigation into Morecambe Bay and East Kent maternity services. And one witness, a bereaved mother in particular, had campaigned for better care and she spoke about her deep sense of hurt that her child was characterized, uh, categorized as stillborn and so it couldn't be issued with a birth certificate. And this sense that stillbirth is a legal or formal category that cuts parents off from social rituals and documents that recognize personhood, that's something that became really crucial to me as I worked on this subject. In her case, there was a real uncertainty as to whether that baby was stillborn or whether it might have survived if resuscitation hadn't been delayed for several minutes. And Dr. Bill Kirkup, who's, who was the chair of that investigation and who's an expert in this area, um, spoke about this to a reporter in the Times. And it fascinates me that what he says is that there's a problem with the way that stillbirth is defined in certain ways. It's defined as, as the absence of breath and it becomes a slightly medieval notion from times past. This repeated reference to the past or especially the medieval past caught my attention. It was clear that all of these speakers wanted to express their perception that stillbirth did not fit in modern life. It wasn't comprehensible as a 21st century life in medicine. It wasn't legible as a familiar narrative. Now, of course, I can see the point. Stillbirth must have been enormously more common in medieval England. We don't have C-sections, we don't have drugs to stimulate labor, we don't have much understanding really at all of things that could expedite a difficult labor. Of course, stillbirth would have been a medieval notion. Any pregnant woman, any sexually active woman would have been haunted by the possibility. And I've seen estimates, it's very hard to arrive at a figure, but I've seen estimates that maybe as many as one in 10 or even one in five pregnancies might have ended in stillbirth. So I found myself wondering how medieval women survived. How did they think about stillbirth? 
How did they grieve? What did they think about loss? I started out by looking at dry facts, which we might call the well-known face of medieval childbirth culture. In medieval church law, a stillborn baby cannot be baptised. As such, that baby couldn't be buried in consecrated ground with its mother. So it's very important for a sense of belonging in the community. Like a stillborn baby today denied a birth certificate, it was officially cut off from the structures of the community. But very soon I found evidence that medieval parents and families didn't simply fall in with this official line. And I'm going to discuss three fragments of evidence about attitudes to stillborn babies, none of which has that traditional, or oh, sorry, one of which has a glimmer of that traditional documentary form, but two of which are really quite a different kind of evidence. And it requires quite a lot of imagination to see how they fit together to form a picture. My first bit of evidence is a will written by a man in early 16th century Suffolk. His name was Robert Duckett. Now he was obviously a person of quite some financial means um, as well as being a family man. He mentions uh, six sons and eight daughters in his will. Even by medieval standards, that's a good big family. But there's a line in his will that stopped me in my tracks. Duckett writes that he wants a memorial to be made in his parish church, which should show himself, his wife, and all of their children. And he writes, we're off of them, one son to lie along, to lie horizontally. For he was quick in his mother's womb and all her time, yet dead born. I find this incredibly poignant. At the stage of writing his will, this event is presumably some years in the past, but this is a man who is still sufficiently fascinated, horrified, upset by the fact that that child was alive in the womb and born dead, that it makes it into his will. And that's not a standard thing to record in wills, which are often very dry documents. What's also incredibly poignant is Sally Badham, who's done the research on this will, suggests that because the date is so close to the Reformation, it's quite likely that memorial was never actually built. Duckett wanted to commemorate his son, but all the evidence suggests that his effort miscarried. Despite this, in general, it's not unusual for memorials to commemorate dead children. This brass um, from about the same period shows Anne Astley of Blickling Hall in Norfolk, who died giving birth to twins. And you can see that she's shown carrying two swaddled babies in her arms. They either died during her labour or at birth. And we know that Anne had other children. Uh, she was not at home but visiting her sister. This, together with the fact that twin pregnancies often result in premature labour, makes me suspect that this was a woman who expected no trouble with her pregnancy, but went into labour and sadly died. My third fragment of evidence is archaeological. A recent excavation of a cemetery in Cheshire found the bones of a fetus dating from the 14th century. Now, this is relatively unusual. The bones of children are incredibly fragile and they often don't survive. People clearly often did bury stillborn children outside recognised graveyards, so we would expect to find fewer remains. We don't know for certain that this baby was stillborn. Um, it's very hard to estimate the age of fetal bones and neonatal bones and to tell the difference between a neonate who's lived maybe a few days or even weeks and a full-term fetus that died either during pregnancy or during labour. But in this case, the bones are so small, it seems really quite likely that, I mean, this is not, this doesn't look like a full term baby. It seems very likely this is a stillborn baby. The burial site is on the edge of the graveyard, which probably suggests that the family or the midwife sneaked the tiny coffin into the very outside of holy ground to bury an unbaptized baby with its community and family. And we know that midwives did this sort of thing. There are records of midwives being penalised for um, showing compassion and burying babies in consecrated ground. But what I find most moving here is that all the evidence shows that this probably stillborn baby was buried with enormous care. It was positioned as if asleep. It was placed in a wooden casket. And the archaeologists who examined the casket say that it would have been worth quite a bit. 
it wasn't a cheap box and they suggest it would probably have carried memories for the family it would have been an object in their homes that was used and valued so a stillborn ba baby is buried in a casket that means something both in terms of material value and in terms of being wrapped up in the memories of the family who had owned and used that object. Putting these three fragments together, we can see that at least some of the time, medieval stillborn babies were treated with profound tenderness and care. The fragments I mentioned, a will, a memorial brass, a tiny casket, are not by any stretch of the imagination the only evidence we have for medieval people grieving profoundly for stillborn babies. And we glimpse here, I think, a sense of a family grieving, not just a mother. This is particularly evident, I think, in my first and third examples. When Robert Duckett expresses his sorrow, he's remembering his son alive in the womb. We can imagine the baby's kicks that he felt with his hand on his wife's belly. When someone, or several someones perhaps, carried a tiny casket to the edge of a cemetery and tucked it into holy ground, it seems very unlikely to have been the recently delivered mother of the baby, but rather a partner or family. So what was the social script for mourning pregnancy loss in medieval England? How were these stillborn babies understood and remembered? What framework was there for these bereaved parents to think about their losses? To explore this further, I looked into a practice and an object that features in a lot of discussions of medieval childbirth culture. So in the period I studied from about 1300 to 1550, childbirth is big business. There's a huge outpouring of books and images and ideas about how to help people through childbirth. And it's surrounded with religious ritual and the best medical knowledge and a strange mishmash of uh, what we would see as early science and also um, charms, almost magical incantations. We know that most women would have given birth attended by other women, ideally excluding the men of the family. It might be a midwife, it might be knowledgeable older relatives. And there were abundant ways that were designed to help the labor progress as smoothly as possible. Medical books make reference to certain remedies or charms, things to eat or drink. They specify which precious stones had the power to prevent catastrophic blood loss. And ideally the room was said to be dark and calm, soothing. So a laboring mother could put all her energies into her body's work. And if you're familiar with childbirth or NCT classes or anything like that, you'll see that this is an interesting mixture of things that are really practical and well understood as therapeutically useful and things that strike us as more foreign and strange. If she could afford it, a woman might make use of one of these. The object that you're seeing on the screen is a roll of parchment with a line of writing running horizontally down its length. If you look close and if you can read Middle English, you can see that just to the left of centre, on the left of that sort of bumpy folded bit, there's the phrase quick with child, that is pregnant. The whole roll is about five and a half feet long. This is just a section that you're seeing. And a roll like this is quite a common format for people to carry around their prayers in. You could roll up your prayers into a little tube and carry them with you. They would be conveniently portable and easy to keep close. This image shows the reverse side of a different roll. Um, and you can see how it would look. One side often has um, writing down the full length. The other one has it in these shorter lines across the surface. And you can cram in plenty of prayers and images and then roll them up into a nice compact little bundle. And I'm just gonna say for the non-medievalists in the room, I'm gonna talk about a few manuscripts. I'm gonna to refer to them by their shelf marks, which are these strings of letters and numbers. Um, so that's what I'm doing when you hear that. This manuscript, for example, is London British Library, Harley Roll T11. And you can see those prayers written across in short lines so that you could unroll the manuscript and read a prayer a little bit at a time. Now the purpose of these prayer rolls is usually pretty multifaceted, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, childbirth isn't by any means the only thing that they were used for. But in the case of childbirth, they were used in a particularly physical way. The inscription that we looked at a minute ago, this one, 
the one that runs the length of the manuscript, reads, if a woman who is quick with child girds her with this measure, the measure of this role, she shall be safe from all manner of perils. We can imagine these roles being used as a, excuse me, used as a sort of spiritual tens machine wrapped around the woman's body. And what I like about this is that the way that it's orientated, if you did wrap it around your belly, someone looking at you would be able to read it. It's the right way up for that. So it's, it's got a sort of practical function to it. Meanwhile, the more dense and lengthy prayers like this one you see here would be pressed against the skin of the laboring belly um, above the fetus in her womb. When they're used in this way, these prayer rolls are often referred to as girdles or birth girdles. And there are loads of references to this practice of wrapping a birth girdle around a pregnant woman's belly and placing its prayers and images against her skin close to her body. But at the same time, although they're protective, these birth girdles and medieval childbirth medicine in general recognize and reflect the possibility a birth may well not go smoothly. It's really disturbing to us how many charms and prayers promise help in bringing a dead child forth from the womb or helping bring on a labor for a woman who believes her child to be dead. But even in cases where nothing seems to have gone wrong, there's no specific reason to fear, the absolutely standard prayer that you say during labor begins with the words, O oh child, be you living or dead, come forth from the womb like Lazarus. And I find it incredibly striking that that's standard. You'd hear that even if you had a perfectly healthy child. But also this phrasing, oh child, be you alive or dead, grants a stillborn child personhood. That child is directly addressed. It is addressed as a child, whatever may happen to it. And this emphasis on death as a constant possibility continues. Most prayer rolls are dominated by images of Christ's passion, the drops of blood he shed on the cross, that's what you're seeing in this image, the wounds he suffered. Some also evoke the pain and suffering of his mother Mary. In much medieval iconography, Mary's grief at the crucifixion is understood as a kind of labour pain, so there's this fantastic idea that um, Christ in the womb didn't cause Mary any pain, her labour was miraculously painless, but the pain wasn't um, just erased because it recurs at the crucifixion. So the crucifixion is imagined almost as a kind of stillbirth and Mary is almost grieving as a pregnant mother seeing her son die. Um, and in the same way you get the Pieta where she's cradling the adult Christ as if he were a dead baby. But this imagery is not merely sad or tragic, but also potentially, I would argue, sustaining the ordinary body in labour becomes, for a moment, physically coterminous with these images of Christ crucified and with the grieving maternal body of his mother. There's a script for grief and mourning in the event of stillbirth, just as much as there's a script for joy and thanksgiving in the event of a successful birth. So whereas my modern um, subjects, the women that I'm reading giving first person accounts of stillbirth now, they're saying part of the shock of stillbirth is that you suddenly go off script. And it's a shock because nobody tells you or prepares you. And people often talk about the fact that often, unfortunately, if you have a stillborn baby, the whole ward is set up on the assumption that you're going to have a living baby. So you're often surrounded by pregnant women giving birth to babies who are going to live um, sometimes and it's awful and it's happening less and less now you might be on a maternity ward having given birth to a stillborn baby and surrounded by women who've got their living babies with them and it's something that um, is addressed again and again in the literature around treatment of stillbirth now that this is really damaging that you veer off script and there's no way for the script to alter around you and accept your reality which has suddenly gone from hope to tragedy but the medieval script doesn't do that it prepares you all the way through for this possibility and it gives you something to see that reflects the sorrow you might feel and i want to suggest that this script for mourning continues even in the finer details of the prayers and images we find on these rolls 
So there's a really strong preference for what you might call calculation images or measurement images. They're images that are accompanied by a prayer or an instruction telling the user to make a calculation or take a measurement. So I'll explain. For example, Takamiya 56, the first manuscript we saw, has an instruction explaining that the manuscript roll is exactly the same height as the Virgin Mary. I love this, I think it's just great. Welcome MS 632 offers to enumerate the number of drops of blood that fell from Christ's body on the cross. And it gives a short verse um, and it says there are 500 drops and then 47,000 and then another 500. So you're left to add them up if you want to get the total number of drops of blood. It's really interactive. It's trying to get you to perform these calculations. The same manuscript offers an image of the nails that were in Christ's cross. Um, and it has a note saying that the length of the cross to which those nails would belong relates to the height of Christ. And this is really common. There are loads of rolls, including this one that you're seeing, which is rather gorgeous, which tell us that the pictured cross is 1 15th of the height of Christ. So you can see just under that top bar of the cross, this cross and it's XV for 15. And it's starting to tell you if you multiply the length of that cross 15 times, you'll get the height of Christ. And this may seem strange to us as a religious practice or a devotional practice, but what's interesting to me is the way that this works as a memory aid. These ubiquitous requirements to us to perform calculations, to think about the length of the physical object in front of us as an analog to an absent body are memory exercises. An absent body is mapped out in terms of the parchment material we see. It's brought into almost tangible reality by the manuscript user who sits doing these calculations and visualizing the dimensions and volumes that are denoted. And it seems to me that this is a kind of ready-made tutorial in memory for a bereaved parent, a demonstration of how one might capture the memory of a body by remembering its dimensions, its relation to a physical object that could be kept. And this resonates really deeply with what we can observe about memory practice and grief. One of the enduring um, concerns that bereaved parents of all children, but perhaps especially children lost to pregnancy loss, express is that they know so little of that baby, they will forget that baby, they don't perhaps have a sense of that baby's physical presence in the world because it was only known in utero. And today it's quite common for um, bereaved parents to take something like a cast of a lost baby's foot as a keepsake. And like the birth girdle, the logic here, the memory logic is one of metonymy, the part of an object like the nails of the cross or the imprint of the foot stands for the whole lost object. It's a smaller thing that reminds us of the scale of the larger loss, the body that cannot be touched, but can be made present in the memory. And it seems to me that the birth girdle is inviting its users to participate in this kind of memorialization, showing how an absent body can be made to seem vivid and real. And this memory practice is further supported by the material medium of the birth girdle. So the materials from which these girdles are made are either parchment, uh, which is animal skin, or paper. And paper at this date is sort of thick and a little bit like blotting paper. Um, both paper and parchment would start to curve and crease if stretched around a warm substance like a pregnant belly. Especially in the case of parchment, which is a bit like leather in the way that it moulds to the shape it's stretched to, these objects would carry and take on and keep the imprint of a pregnancy, even after that pregnancy was no more and the objects had been folded up and stored away much as one might keep an object of clothing or a blanket in which a stillborn baby had been wrapped, one might associate the creases and curves of a prayer roll with the fetus that had once lain beneath its enveloping substance. But the prayer roll goes beyond what many other keepsakes and memorials might do in that, as I said earlier, it's a multi-purpose object. Alongside these prayers that are specifically designed for childbirth, we find prayers for other and diverse medical and spiritual emergencies. And these are lovely. 
there are serious ones like protection from death in drowning, protection from the plague, prayers used to protect soldiers in battle, which are sometimes fascinatingly threaded into the childbirth prayers as if the laboring woman is a kind of soldier. But we also find prayers that give a glimpse of more routine or even mundane life experiences. Welcome MS 632 declares its owner may not be found guilty in a law court if he's carrying the role. His or her property will increase and it will be protected against robbery. Another role, now Yale Bionica MS 410, claims to protect its users from bad weather, thunder and death before confession. This miscellany of purposes lets us imagine that these prayer roles could be used by men or women, children or adults, for daily needs, but also for special emergencies. In short, they're what I would see as family prayers and family books. They're designed to support the wide range of needs of a busy medieval family. If they were a book today, you'd imagine them being taken down from the shelf very often or carried around in the pocket on a regular basis. And this integrates stillbirth into a wider textualization of medical and spiritual experience. It takes that stillbirth out of the female dominated context of the birthing chamber and makes it one event in a wider life journey, one crease in a role used for other purposes where one might take down a prayer role and be reminded yet again of a loved and lost child. In the time I've been researching this subject, I've been really stunned by the huge amount of work that midwives and campaigners and all sorts of medical professionals have put into providing better emotional care for women and families experiencing stillbirth. And I really want to respect and acknowledge that work which is ongoing and which is hugely beyond what um, I think I would have imagined even 10 or 15 years ago but cultures change very slowly. It's really not so long that the official medical advice following a stillbirth was to try to forget and move on. Even today, you read a lot of first person accounts such as those I quoted earlier, where people's partners or families feel that forgetting is the best and healthiest option. And we know that a huge amount of trauma comes out of this, um, attitude towards memory and this struggle to find appropriate ways of memorializing this kind of loss. The mere fact that stillbirth comes as such a huge shock that it strikes so many of us as medieval or historical, something that doesn't belong in the present day, is proof enough that we do not yet have enough ways to memorialize and live with this kind of loss. At the beginning of this talk, I quoted a couple of accounts of 21st century women responding to stillbirth, but I have read hundreds and virtually all of them express this same sense of disorientation, of being jolted out of their expected 21st century narrative of pregnancy and birth. I can't and I wouldn't suggest that medieval culture offers a solution. There's much in medieval childbirth ritual that might strike us as strange or alien, even macabre, the intense religiosity does not sit easily with our more secular society. But even so, I really think the birth girdle is incredibly well adapted to serve the needs of parents who've lost a child to stillbirth. It's enabling these kinds of memory work that recall loss, but also relate that loss to larger religious structures and to wider everyday concerns. A child lost to stillbirth in medieval England could be carried in the memory as conveniently as a small roll of prayers kept close to the body, calculated daily, known and remembered. Thanks very much for listening. Lucy, thank you so much. I, I was waiting for my video to appear on the screen, but I'm so grateful for a fantastic, really enlightening talk. So insightful and sensitive and wide reaching, wide ranging across so many, so many ideas of which I'm familiar with some and some I'm absolutely not. I'm brimming with questions and I'm sure many of us, many of us are. Um, let me just note 
for all of our audience, please do um, click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to type a question into the chat. Um, Lucy, may I begin by asking you a question? I have a, I have about a thousand, but the um, the um, the, um, the the girdle that you were describing and the way that it is a real social script for mourning. I find that fascinating because we do read a lot about uh, it's a script for mourning. Sorry. And I find it fascinating because we read a lot about in the contemporary experience of pregnancy and baby loss. Um, what we don't have are social scripts. We, you know, as you say, we, 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 we're just sort of lost in this world where nobody will acknowledge even the, the social identity of the baby. So I can see how this, um, the, the girdle that you've described um, um, can create a, a kind of expectation and a framework for bereaved families to understand and kind of place their experience. What I want to know is, does that expand out into their wider social world? The reason I ask that is because a lot of the, the kind of use of objects, of mourning objects in contemporary baby loss is to build up a social identity around the baby who otherwise doesn't have a social identity and sadly whose social identity is often um, is often denied by even well-wishing family and friends. So we, 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 we accumulate objects. Um, is there a need for that as much in the medieval period? Were these babies... Um, acknowledged as part of the social world, even if they were clearly acknowledged as part of the family and, and mourned and loved as part of the family. Did these prayer roles and these um, preparations for death allow the babies to be part of the social conversation or did it stay within the family? It's really hard to know and I'm sure as we, you know this this varies in modern culture so I see no reason why it wouldn't in medieval culture. Um, I think Robert Ducker is a great example of someone who really felt passionately that it was going to go out into his parish church if that memorial had been made, which it quite possibly wasn't, it would have been enormous and eye-catching and everyone would have seen it and everyone would have said, oh look, there's that picture of him and his wife and oh, that's his stillborn child. Clearly that happened. And, and again with Anne Astley, that's an incredibly poignant brass that she has the two twins and she's got her laces still undone because she's still sort of you know, she's, she's still all stretched out with pregnancy. And it's a very immediate image. So clearly there are examples that would say people did want these put in public places and, and the sense of the child being part of that social world. Um, there must also have been cases where that didn't happen. Um, and there's also a huge, huge amount we don't know about. Um, not everybody is terribly bothered. There's a really poignant letter from Catherine of Aragon where she's given birth to a stillborn daughter. And she writes to her father saying, the English seem terribly upset about this. I don't really understand why. And it's awful because you don't know if she's putting on a brave face for her dad. And, and her mother was the most, you know, hardcore woman who had a miscarriage and got back on her horse. So maybe she was putting on a brave face. But she does seem to be saying the English are a bit peculiar that they're upset by stillbirths. And I'm not personally. So it, it's hard to know. Thank you, thank you. I can see the, um, the, the questions are accumulating in the chat now. Let me have a look. We're seeing lots of thank you, thank you so much. This was so fascinating. Um, let me begin with this one. Um, okay, Gwen Seaborn. Um, thank you, this was great. Can I ask about vocabulary? Most languages have a version of the dead born, whereas English has come to fix on stillborn, which has rather different nuances. The earliest stillborn I've seen is in a Wycliffe Bible, but that's a bit of a one-off. Are, you, are your Middle English sources using stillborn? That's such a good question. And I, I must now look into that because I can't actually remember offhand what people are using. Um, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I do find it fascinating that we still use stillborn. And I find it very poignant that some people, that there's a folk etymology in modern culture that my child was stillborn. He was born despite the fact that he, he died. And people will say that. And of course, stillborn means born still, born motionless. And it's really sad. And sometimes people get very upset when they realize that's the actual etymological meaning. So I must look into that more. That's such a good question. Um, we have a question from Elaine Perrier of Farrell. Um, thank you, Lucy, for a fantastic, a fascinating paper, considering um, that in the medieval times, a stillbirth, a stillbirth child was not entitled to baptism and in model, modern times to a birth certificate. Do you think that in the medieval period, there was a clear differentiation between a stillborn child and an abortion or natural uh, miscarriage? Um, and if so, how do you think this difference was made by lawyers, et cetera? 
That's a really good question. That's interesting. Um, so there, there isn't a sort of uh, hard and fast sense of when a child counts as a miscarriage or a stillbirth, but there is a very, there is a historical, there is a belief amongst historians, I'm choosing my words really carefully, there is a belief amongst historians that until fairly recently people didn't understand miscarriages until quite late to be miscarriages, they thought they were gushes of blood that were cleansing the womb. To be honest, I think this is likely to be bullshit because I think you know mostly people who are experienced in pregnancy are, are a bit cleverer than that and it seems to me one of those myths that grows up around saying women are really stupid um, but I do think people would probably not have had that clear sense of what's a miscarriage and what's a stillbirth it would have been more of a spectrum um, as far as abortion goes abortion is one of those interesting things where the church is sort of okay with it if it's very early and if it's done out of need um, but yeah, I think there was definitely a sense of this being a spectrum. Where you get legal complications is when it's unclear whether it's a stillbirth or a neonatal death. And then the legal position is clear. If it's a living child, it must be heard to cry or squall within, squall within four walls. Which means it can't just be the women in the birth chamber who say, yes, it was alive because we don't trust women. It must be men in the house who've heard it cry. And then you know, even if it died after that, it counts as a living child. And this comes up, of course, in inheritance cases because you can't inherit through a stillborn child, you can only inherit through a living child. But that's where the legal complications seem to me to come in. Mm. Thank you. Um, Laura Callas, thank you so much for this fascinating paper, Lucy. The connections you've drawn between medieval and modern experiences of stillbirth are very po poignant. I'd like to ask about the scripted nature that the birth girdle provides for the Potorian woman. And, um, and the event as a moment of multi-temporality, the woman at a crossroads which might lead to joy or loss. Do you think that that was a psychological state that a medieval birthing woman would find normative, at, or at least more normative, more so than women today? Yes, I think enormously more normative. If you look at the prayers, it's so common to acknowledge that this might not end well, and it would have been statistically so common, but I think it's really in a horrible way, it is helpful because, I mean, even if we leave aside stillbirth, all kinds of birth trauma, there's really overwhelming evidence saying the better you are prepared for the fact it might all go badly wrong, the less likely you are to find it traumatic. And it's absolutely horrible to think how well prepared some medieval women were by these prayers, but I think they really were. Mm. I hope that answered that. Yeah. Um, and that's very much part of the um, what we what we learn today. The more the more anticipatory, the more preparation you can do. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's a question. This is fascinating. Ta Tara Maria, I'm wondering how social class features in this exploration of stillbirth. Um, I imagine that objects using words and writing would be fairly exclusive. Yes, they probably are. Although it's interesting, um, there are definitely instructions saying things like you know, get someone to write this down and strap it onto your belly so you don't have to have the the money to get a full birth girdle manuscript if you were less well off you could get someone who could write and you could have them write a prayer and you could you don't have to be able to read the prayer yourself that's that's a key thing um you you might know that it's powerful without having to read it and there are lovely examples where you can actually cut the prayer into an apple and eat it or dissolve it in wine and drink it and it's quite obvious that the power of the prayer is not in the reading it's in the placing it on your body or consuming it into your body but yeah i'm sure social class plays a huge role here and there would have been people who couldn't access really any help and we know so little about them so yeah it's it's a real problem um, Courtney Beatty has three questions and I think I will, I think I'll ask them one at a time, otherwise you have to store them in your memory. Um, so first, earlier you mentioned life write, the, uh, the life writing, oh, hang on a minute, you mentioned life writing community and historical database. Is it open to the public? Uh, is, it a web, is there a website where I can find out more? I think you're talking about the Lives in Medicine database rather than anything specifically that Lucy mentioned, am I right? 
Um, so that's not yet accessible to the public. And a big part of the project that we're working on in Lives in Medicine is creating, is making sure that there is a public facing interface. At the moment, it's very much um, closed and under construction and accessible with various bits of training to the specific researchers. Um, you can have a look on the Oclu website under Lives in Medicine and have a look. And if you really are determined and interested to have a, to, to really find out more, uh, please do um, contact us. You can email and we can um, see whether we, there's any way we can make it accessible. It, but in the future, it will definitely be accessible to the public and researchers. And that's one of the goals. Lucy, did you want to say something just then? No, okay. Sorry. That's question one. Question two, um, did the women um, keep these roles? Sorry. Oh, ah, did the women keep these roles the way some women make casts of their bellies? I, no, basically. Um, I think these were family objects. Um, very often, actually, they were probably made for men who lent them out to their wives. You also have examples where um, a religious foundation would own it and they'd loan it out to people. So it's not something um, that is very, very narrowly specific to that pregnancy or that woman. And I think that's what makes it really useful because there's a sense that it's a communal object or a family object. It's not something that you're keeping and saying, I'm setting in stone my experience of stillbirth and sort of as it were, putting it in a drawer where I can privately remember it, you'll say, this is my memory, but it's also going to become part of the memory and part of the experience of everyone who knows that I've experienced this and uses this role. Mm. Mm. Um, and then the, the last, these questions were, do you think that this, these, 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 um, these girdles were a form of Kaelin? I might've misspelled this, she says Kaelin, an Irish word for unsanctified ground. I don't know of any relationship to that. I wouldn't be the person to ask because I don't really work, despite being in Ireland, I don't work a great deal on the Irish traditions and it's, they're quite different, but I've not heard of a connection. Okay. Um, oh, here's a good one. Is your book published? Has it been, is your book available? Has it been published? Give us the publication. Give us the <laughs> Well, the book, my, my published <laughs> book has nothing to do with this. So I can say I, I have a published book, but it's about Chaucer and lesbians. It's brilliant. You should all read it. Um, but it's got nothing to do with this. Um, I do have an article about um, stillbirth, which will be coming out in the Chaucer Review, I hope, if they accept it. So what you need to do is cross your fingers for me that they accept it. <laughs> But no, I don't have a book on this subject yet. This this um, fellowship is meant to be developing that book. But thank You're you. very active on Twitter, aren't you? And so um, people can follow you to find out more. Your Twitter handle is, tell me your Twitter handle. Lucy Allen, FWR. I should repeat that at the end. So any any updates will, will, will be forthcoming on Twitter, I'm sure. Uh, okay, here's another question. We've got about 10 more minutes. And I think we can squeeze in lots of questions in that time. I was wondering how ideas about purgatory might have shaped the grieving process. Oh, yes. So um, this is something that hardens up over the medieval um, period. Um, Augustine is very sure that stillborn babies are damned and then people soften up a little bit and we get this idea of limbo where they're in a sort of nothingness and it's not painful but it's nothing um so stillborn babies don't end up in purgatory um it's it's really it's it's horrible and i mean clearly medieval people felt really upset about this you get lots of stories of people um whose babies were miraculously brought to life for just enough time to sort of gasp a breath get baptized and die so people were clearly there was a lot of trauma around that um, and people would rather think their babies would sort of take a breath and die than, than, than not live at all. It's, it's really, really sad. Um, so I'm another question, uh, Sarah Callahan. I'm very interested in how long the birth girdle tradition experienced. I work at the Marion Library in Dayton, um, Ohio, Ohio, right? Oh, yes, sorry. And we have several German language scrolls from the 18th century. I think uh, we think they must have been used for similar purposes and one is supposed to have been the length of the Virgin Mary. Yes, so um, I don't know specifically about the birth girdle. You certainly get printed versions. So it was, it was um, that suggests that it was in full flower well into the um, early modern period. And I think it was then clamped down on in this country because of the Reformation. It was seen as sort of quite a Catholic thing. Um, although um, I've certainly heard it suggested that recusant Catholics might have kept girdles. The thing with um, the length of the Virgin Mary is none of these prayers are unique to the childbirth tradition, right? They're all through protective medicine. Um, so finding 
the length of the Virgin Mary doesn't prove that it has to do with childbirth or that, that that's the key survival. Does that make sense? I hope so. Thank you. Um, okay, Miranda Griffin, thank you for that wonderful talk. I loved your point about um, a pregnancy being remembered in the shape of a prayer role. role. Um, the story of the life of Margaret was also written onto birth girdles. There's one in the welcome, as I'm sure you know. Might St. Margaret, as well as the Virgin, be a figure who would enable people, women to contemplate birth? I'd always thought of prayer girdles as a means of thinking about birth beforehand, but your fantastic talk has also made me think about them as a way to um, as ways of thinking back to a birth. Thank you again. Thank you, that's a lovely question. Yeah, um, it's interesting. St. Margaret doesn't feature all that much on prayer rolls that I've seen, and you tend to get Saints Julita and Quiricus instead. And there's a huge controversy in birth girdle studies at the moment about whether we should call them birth girdles or whether we just say general prayer rolls. And I have called them prayer rolls except when they're being used as birth girdles, which is a bit slipping out of that in a cowardly way. But um, yeah, people definitely read the story of St. Margaret and explicitly use it as a, a way to think about birth, but it doesn't tend to come up on the actual girdles so far as I've seen. I'm not sure of the reasons for that and it would be interesting to speculate. I just, I just don't really know. Um, I think I've read all the questions that we have at the moment on the chat, but please do throw some more in, but it gives me an opportunity to ask some more of my many questions. <laughs> um, but I'm really interested in um, the memorializing of the baby, who the lost baby, because I think the loss of a baby is maybe a particularly physical uh, mourning. Um, and we know that you know, in, the con in contemporary baby loss and pregnancy loss, that's one of the big roles of, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that the kind of social role of kind of constructing the um, social identity of the baby through objects, uh, by accumulating objects, but also we hold blankets, we hold teddies, we have things that have kind of the softness and the size and the shape and the feeling of, of the babies. Um, do, you, do you know of any evidence of, of, of objects being used in this way or, or would that not have been necessarily written about, I guess, because it might have been the, the mute mothers who might be doing these practices, the unwritten? That is such a fascinating question and I would love to know. I don't know. Um, something that's terribly sad in all of this is that, um, in theory at least, these mothers wouldn't have been able to bury their own babies that have been confined um, for for the purification period afterwards um, and so you think perhaps they'd want to keep something um, but I'm not sure how much actual jurisdiction they would have had over what happened to the baby afterwards mm -hmm. because some of these objects you know what's what's what often happens in a modern context is someone will have the baby with them for a little bit and dress it and and and, and you know and then keep the blanket it was swaddled in and I'm not clear that there was actually an opportunity to do that um, and of course the, you know for some women there must have been because there would have been no one else to do it but whether if you're so poor that there's no one to help you bury your baby whether you are financially able to keep a blanket is something I rather doubt. Um, we do know that there are sort of peculiar slightly puzzling things that people keep so there's this very weird case where uh, a husband and wife were um, censured in court because they were kept a cradle with a, a, a doll in it. Um, and this is something Rachel Moss, who I know is here, brought to my attention a few years ago. They kept this cradle and they'd been rocking the, the cradle with the doll as if it was a baby. And I've seen loads of explanations of why was this bad? And it, it could be that that was a form of some kind of mourning for a child they'd not had or a child that had died. Unfortunately, it could also be just, you know, it's connected into religious practice that people would pretend babies with Jesus and rock them. So I don't know if they're doing a religious transgression or a weird form of memory, but this is really characteristic of medieval culture that you have these tiny fragments and it's so hard to say what they mean. And all you can do is sort of put them out there and say, maybe. So I'm saying, maybe, I don't know. Um, I have, we've got a couple more questions, um, minutes left. I have a question actually. I wondered if we might relate this, not exactly to the to, to your book, but not exactly to the content of your book, because I appreciate you say it really is a, a different subject, but that was really looking at literature and I suppose scouring literature for um, evidence of, of thought, of medieval thought and the way that, you know, women were conceived of and, and, and so on. Um, I, I've just, I mean, I'm not a historian, so I'm just very interested the kind of different kinds of affordances, the different kinds of um, uh, 
possibilities of exploring historical documents that are not literary compared to obviously historical literary creations and, and the kinds of um, different insights that those things can bring us um, to um, kind of the lived experience of women. Yeah, I mean, I'm only sort of 10 years the historian. I'm in a history department, but I do a lot of work in literature. And I think my approach mostly is trying to say, I'm going to use historical sources, but I also want to give full weight to the kind of emotional side, which often does come out of the literature. Um, and what I'm seeing in a lot of the work on um, stillbirth um, and pregnancy loss is that we have these dry historical documents that say, oh no, you couldn't bury a, a stillborn baby. Um, or, you know, there's even this horrible thing that you should cut a, a baby that's died in utero out of its mother's body so that you can bury them separately. And it sounds all very clinical and uncaring. But then when you do look at the um, accounts like that will or accounts, literary accounts, you get a much greater sense of people's compassion. And frankly, I mean, I'm sure if you read the minutes of um, meetings about the Morecambe Bay investigations, they would look equally clinical and dry to someone coming in 500 years time. So very often what I am trying to do is say, I don't want to get sentimental about it, but I do want to give the history of emotions its full weight. And I want to kind of get into this life writing really and borrow those techniques for saying, how can I write these lives and give a sense that there might have been emotion there and there might have been people caring and piece together the fragments and say, is this suggestive? Yes, I think it is. That was a really wordy answer, sorry. No, wonderful, wonderful. The more words are better. <laughs> we have another question that snuck on. Um, this might be our last question. Um, the Eventbrite email confirmation with Zoom login detail has a picture of what appears to be a medieval birth with the baby coming out of the woman's stomach, which I was so fascinated by. Do you know anything about this picture? Would cesarean births have been used? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love this image because it's just so fantastically gory and the mother's just like, oh, for goodness sake, guys. Um, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Um, C-sections are fatal until um, very, very late on. Um, C-sections, you still get fatal C-sections at the beginning of the last century. Um, mm -hmm. Although, you know, they, they were being performed, but, you know, no, not, not even possibly. What people did do, so that, 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 you get a lot of these images because people like the idea that Julius Caesar was plucked from his mother's womb. You do clearly get people who did um, try and get the baby out of the mother's womb if she was dying. And this is perhaps part of the reason for that church law saying a midwife should be prepared to remove a fetus from a dying woman. It's not just so you can bury them separately. It is presumably also because if you have about three minutes time, you could you could get conceivably get the baby out before the mother died especially if she's hemorrhaging or something quick um but I don't there's 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 no possibility of women surviving and you occasionally get reports of it and it's always bad history okay it's really sad yeah it's very very sad um I think we should draw to a close but um I I do want to well first of all I must there's been so many grateful and happy comments in the you know please you know i would i would come to more of these talks do more of this thank you so much lucy um sue spencer has written please think about writing for the medical humanities journal um we we are in response to a quick question here we have been having these sessions effectively in private and i don't think it makes sense to hold hold the public away hold hold people away who are very interested so i think we will continue to try to find ways to have these conversations with more people um listening in and asking questions because i think it does make absolute sense we will absolutely um let our mailing list and on twitter we'll let you all know of any future events um please do have a look at the website there's also a friends scheme which you might be interested in joining so that there are which gives you access to more events and also supports some of the, the free events and so on um so do have a look on the Oclu website um to find out more about that and to join our mailing list as well um but lucy listen i really want to thank you because this is um really a very difficult subject in many ways um you've you've made it vivid and come alive and um not horrible 
while being very sensitive to the realities that many of us do live through these these terrifyingly upsetting experiences and i'm so grateful for the sensitivity and insight you've shown in in addressing these things and as and i'm sure many of us have been affected by these experiences in our past so i i you know we we send you all the best and perhaps it's time for a nice warm cup of tea and a, and, a, and some five minutes break for a reflection or something after this because the zoom call will end and we'll be all alone with our thoughts but Hi. lucy yeah before it ends, can I say thank you so much? Because it was enormously helpful to me to have all those questions. And I feel like it was a huge privilege. So thank you very much to everyone for coming and to you for having me. Well, it's a tremendous pleasure. And I hope that we will have you again and have all of our audience again. And I think with that, I'll thank, thank everybody again so very much. And we'll, we'll say good night. Good night. And hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.